uh, Paolo Costa. I am from the Microsoft uh, Research Team. And uh, it's my great honor to chair this session on data center programming. It's going to be packed with great content, so please stay until the end. First, uh, we are going to hear about two papers. Uh, they are talking about experience uh, from two large scale data center providers, talking about you know, their uh, challenges and solutions to improve network programmability, flexibility, and uh, enable faster network migration. And then there are going to be two very exciting papers discussing how we can make it easier to program the network. And second, an interesting use case on how we can use in network compute capabilities to optimize packet reordering. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone, same uh, rule of engagement. So there are going to be at the end of the, each talk time for one or two questions. So please raise your hand, and somebody will come and bring you a mic. Uh, you can also ask questions on Slack if you prefer. I'm going to be keep an eye on the on the chat, and I can ask the question. And then at the very end, there are going to be a panel, a mini panel with all the speakers. So if you have also questions, you know, that are for general, uh, you know, um, that applies to the more than one paper, please also keep them for the end. Fantastic. OK, so we can start with the first speaker. Sorry, let me just take my note. So first, uh, first speaker is Zhi Kong. Yeah, OK. Sorry, I'm going to be very bad with pronunciation. Apologies to everyone. Who is a staff engineer and senior manager at Alibaba Cloud and focusing on data center, virtual networking, and especially on virtual switch. And Alibaba is hiring. So if you're interested in uh, working with them, please reach out to Zikong after the, the end of the, of the session. OK, over to you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here to share with you the design and experience of Oculus, the network virtualization platform of Alibaba Cloud. This paper is a joint work with Zhejiang University, Tsinghua University, and Alibaba Cloud. So what is Oculus? Oculus is the network virtualization platform of Alibaba Cloud. It consists of three key components, the SDN controller on the control plan, and the vSwitch and gateway on the data plan. The controller manages all network-related configuration and issues network rules into vSwitch and Gateway. On the data plan, vSwitch serves as a per-host switching node dedicated to VM traffic forwarding. The Gateway acting as a higher-level forwarding component, especially for the north-south traffic. The development of Aculus 1.0 began over 10 years ago. A major change of Aculus 1.0 was the migration from classic underlay network to VPC overlay network. Since 2015, we started Aculus 2.0. Besides the performance improvement, we offloaded the east-west traffic from gateway to vSwitch to avoid potential bottlenecks. First, I will quickly go through how packet is forwarded in Aculus 2.0. The per host vSwitch uses VM host mapping table to forward packets to the destination. As mentioned earlier, a big change in Aculus 2.0 is the east west traffic uploading. The way to achieve this is to let the controller push all VHT to all vSwitch inside the VPC. As the slide shows, when VM2 migrates from host 2 to host 3, the VHT entry will be updated, and the controller needs to push the updated new VMT entry to all vSwitch inside the VPC. So here comes the first challenge. The VPC could be huge, includes millions of VM, as the left graph shows, and the VM creates and destroys all the time. So the controller would be busy pushing VHT updates to all vSwitch, resulting in slow network convergence. And the second challenge is how to balance isolation and elasticity as network middlebox moving to the cloud. Resource contention increases due to the heavy and bursty traffic of the middlebox. The middle graph shows the CPU contention in a production environment we can see that the CPU contention does exist and uh, presents a bursty characteristic. The third challenge is risk detection and recovery. 
as the scale and complexity of atlas increases, existing risk detection becomes less reliable. Network operation and maintenance heavily rely on human intervention, and this is time consuming. To address these challenges, Actors evolved to 2.1 with three clear goals, hyperscale programmability, elasticity, and reliability. To achieve hyperscale programmability, Actors 2.1 introduced the active learning mechanism, also known as ALM. The workflow of active learning mechanism is shown in the slides. The first packet between the source and destination goes through the gateway. In the meantime, the vSwitch initiates a, a root synchronization request packet to the gateway to learn the VHT entry of the destination. Then the gateway responses the corresponding VHT entry within the root synchronization reply packet. Then the subsequent packets to the destination will be directly forwarded by vSwitch. In this way, the controller only needs to program the VHT information into the gateway rather than all the switch inside the VPC. So here is the evaluation result of active learning mechanism. From the left graph, we can see the convergence time remains no more than two seconds, despite the number of VM increased from hundreds to millions. We also measured the overhead of root synchronization protocol. The result shows it costs less than 4% of the total traffic. Comparing the benefits it brings, this is uh, cost is accept acceptable. For the isolation and elasticity challenge, Aculus 2.1 Aculus 2 introduced both scale-up and scale-out mechanisms. Scale-up is for short-term burst traffic and scale out is for long-term business increases. Elastic credit algorithm is our solution to scale up. The reason we introduce it is because existing BPS and PPS rate limiting cannot meet the isolation requirement. This is because CPU cost varies significantly depending on the type of the traffic. For instance, new connection consumes much more CPU cycles than existing connection. And short-lived connection cost much more CPU cycles than long-lived connections. The left graph takes a simple example to illustrate the algorithm. We constantly measure how much CPU cycles of the vSwitch consumed by each VM. When the current consumed cycles is less than the assigned quota, then we accumulate credits for the VM. And when the consumed cycles greater than the, assigned, than the assigned quota, the accumulated credits is consumed to handle the first until the credits are exhausted. Then the VM is limited to the assigned quota to ensure isolation. And for scale out, we introduce distributed SMP mechanism, which allows multiple middle boxes to share the same network configuration, such as IP address. The source vSwitch spreads traffic to these service nodes with SMP routing, and it is supposed auto-scaling. When a new service node added to the SMP group, the VHT entry will be updated automatically without any manual configuration. With distributed SMP mechanism, we have successfully migrated most of the network middle boxes into Aculus, such as Cloud Load Balancer and Cloud Firewall. By using Elastic Credit Algorithm, we not only well handled the burst traffic of the middle box, but also reduced the overall resource contention. The right graph shows Elastic Credit Algorithm reduces the CPU contention by 75%. For the risk detection and recovery problem, Aculus 2.1 introduced an active detection method between the VM to vSwitch and the vSwitch to vSwitch. As shown in the right table, with the help of active detection, 
234 risks, risks were detected in two months. We can see that many risks can be predicted and mitigated, such as uh, CPU contention and hardware warnings can be recovered by live migration. However, live migration is not that easy when it comes to seamless user experience. Accurate 2.1 resolved this issue by two techniques. For stateless traffic, we use traffic redirection. During the VHT convergence time, the vSwitch on the source host of the migration redirects traffic to the target host to resume network connectivity. For stateful traffic, just resuming network connectivity is not enough as it needs connection track. The solution of uh, Acular's 2.1 evolved from station reset to station sync, which copies all stateful sessions to the target switch to address the issue. The evaluation shows with the traffic direction, redirection, and station sync techniques, the median downtime of live migration reduced to 100 milliseconds. To conclude, for programmability, we introduce active learning mechanism to ensure sub-second level programming time even when there are millions of instances. For elasticity, we design elastic credit algorithm and a distributed SMP mechanism for seamless scale up and scale out under the premise of isolation. For reliability, the risk awareness and live migration ensure 100 milliseconds recovery time for talents. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much for the great talk. Um, questions? Yeah, Dave? In the case of updates uh, yeah. after life migration or any other change, okay. do you see a tail behavior where there are a couple of uh, hosts that don't get the update, and how do you handle those? And what kind of uh, tail behavior have you seen in terms of time to finish all updates? Okay, uh, because we implemented the active learning mechanism, so. So the convergence time almost uh, irrelevant to the, to the size of the VPC, but uh, even there are maybe some hosts have some problem, so the tail latency will be high, but uh, this only affects the prob problematic host. It does not affect the controller plan at all. Okay. If there are no more questions, okay, I think we can thank the speaker again. Okay. Um, there will be a panel at the end also, so, so if you, there's an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Okay, now we move to the second talk of the session. So it's my pleasure to introduce He Hao, okay. <laughs> which uh, who is a PhD candidate at Peking University. He's a researcher in a data center network and AI systems and a special large scale scheduling problem. So don't rush to hire him because uh, he said that uh, he's going to finish uh, to his PhD in 2026, so it's still a bit of time. But I'm sure maybe you would be interested in uh, hearing about internship opportunities or other things before you finish the PhD. OK, with this, you know, over to you. Thank you for the introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm Yihao from Peking University. Today, I'm very glad to share our work, Klauske, Efficient and Safe Network Migration of Large Production Data Centers. This is joint work with my co-authors from Meta, Johns Hopkins University, and Peking University. Large web service providers heavily depend on data center networks to, uh, to deliver uh, reliable and smooth experience to users. And data center networks are constantly scaling and evolving because of at least three reasons. First, the data center traffic is increasing at a very fast pace, especially under the new technology trends like large language models. And second, switch failures are the norm rather than the exception especially in large-scale multi-layer data center networks. Third, there are routine procedures to retire old hardware and onboard new hardware. 
The scaling and evolution of data center networks rely on network migration, which changes the switches and the circuits by draining and draining or swapping switches and the circuits. Unlike operating on the control plane or data plane, uh, the mi network migration involves some physical, uh, some physical deployment work. And this is uh, a manual process performed by human operators, which makes this problem time, time consuming and complicated. The objective of network migration is to perform network migration efficiently and safely. For efficiency, we need to minimize the time of generating migration plans and performing the migration plans. For safety, we need to satisfy dynamic traffic demands and absorb traffic bursts during the migration process. At Meta, there are three large-scale uh, migration types that have happened in the past few years. And these migrations replaces or add switches in different layers, and we name them H-grid V1 to V2 migration, SSW forklift migration, and DMIC migration. These migration types involve hundreds of switches, tens of thousands of circuits, and tens of terabytes, and can take several months. So why is the network migration problem difficult? First, the data center network architecture is complex and evolving. At Meta, there are eight layers and more than nine types of switches, which is more complicated than the conventional cloth network topologies. Besides, multiple generations of switches, circuits, and routing protocols may coexist in a single migration task. Second, Various operational requirements exacerbate the network migration problem. The demand variance is not negligible considering the long duration of migration. The traffic grows organically over time, and unexpected traffic bursts happens occasionally. Additionally, the total number of ports on the hardware is a hard constraint. Third is the large space, a search space of the planning problem. A real-world migration task usually involves hundreds of switches per data center. And the number of possible migration plans or the number of permutations of these switches is more than 100 of and 57 power of 10. The efficiency requirement makes the problem more difficult. Here, we consider both the time to generate the migration plan and the time to finish the migration plan. Previous work mainly lies in two categories, grid-based planner and a symmetry-based planner. The grid-based planner utilizes the grid strategies, but it cannot guarantee the optimality of the migration plans. The symmetry-based planner utilizes the inherent symmetry of the data center network architecture, but it cannot scale to complex migration types and topologies. To solve the challenges, we introduce Clause Key, a system for efficient, safe, and optimal data center network migration of large production data centers. Klosky reduces the time to get the mig optimal migration plan by up to 381 times compared with previous work. And it has been deployed at Meta, at Meta since 2020 to serve 20 regions. Klosky takes constraints, forecasted traffic, original topology, and target topology as input. First, it prunes the large search space by inherent symmetry and the locality of data center network without affecting the optimality. Then, the planner of Clause K computes the optimal migration plan by a star search algorithm. Specifically, in order to leave room for traffic spikes, the demand constraint requires the utilization rate of each circuit to be lower than a threshold. Besides, the port constraint limits the number of user ports. The objective of the migration planning is to minimize the operational cost. The operational cost mainly come from two consecutive actions with different action types, because in practice, uh, actions with the same types can be operated simultaneously with almost no extra cost. The large number of switches leads to an extremely large search space. Like previous work, we also utilize the symmetry property of switches. However, there is little symmetry in metadata center networks, making this approach inefficient. We further utilize the locality of switches, and one key observation is that operating the switches close to each other 
um, simultaneously leads to little extra cost and little impact on constraints. Thus, we merge switches into, with locality into one operation block and operate them together. This greatly prunes the search space. While searching for the optimal plan, the planner needs to check the satisfiability of constraints again and again, even for the same topology, which is time consuming. We found that the constraint satisfiability is only related to the uh, current topology, no matter what the action sequence is. Thus, we can further reduce the time for checking with a cache table. Searching all states still costs too much time in practice. We leverage the A star search algorithm with domain specific priority, which searches states with the, uh, which have smaller estimated operational costs first. Specifically, the estimated operational cost is the existing cost plus the uh, estimated remaining cost. Here, we take the number of remaining action types as the estimated part. This technique further speeds up the search process. Our evaluation is performed with five production level data center network topologies with up to 10,000 switches and 100,000 circuits. The three migration types involve up to 700 actions. We use the historical traffic collected by Meta's data center network. We first evaluate the optimality of the plans. Klosky can always get the optimal migration plan with all topology sizes and the migration types we evaluated. We also evaluated the efficiency. Klosky reduced the planning time by up to 381 times compared with baselines. Klosky finds the optimal plans for all test cases within four minutes, while baselines may not find feasible plans within 24 hours. Next, I'd like to share our operational experience. In some production scenarios, network operators need to create special routing configurations during the migration process to utilize the special intermediate topology. Also, we need to incorporate traffic demand and uh, focus into the migration process because the migration may take several months and the traffic may increase drastically. Besides the standard demand and port constraints, we also handle with other operational constraints including the failures during operation duration, simultaneous operations, and expected traffic surge, and so on. We also explored various deep learning methods like reinforcement learning and graph neural network. However, we made some practical obstacles, including scalability, efficiency, and reliability. To conclude, Klosky is a production system for efficient and safe data center network migration. We formulate the migration planning with domain-specific constraints for safe network migration, and we also leverage locality and informed search to improve efficiency. Klosky is actively running at Meta data centers. Thank you for listening. Thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Questions? Yep. Ian from um, Bytedance Networking again. Um, Indeed, this, is, this looks like a very complicated problem, um, considering all the constraints. So I wonder if you had, can provide some insight. You mentioned uh, the, the typical DCN migration took about several months. Can you provide some insight, the breakdown of this time, or what, what's the biggest challenge? Well, why does it take so, so long? What's the biggest chunk of time to spend on this migration? Cool. Uh, thanks so much for the question. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? You, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I forgot to uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Xiao Xiang, and I'm from Meta. So usually, before we have Klosky, it will need to take several months to, you know, to figure out the migration plan. This is because there are lots of manual work, such as we need to manually calculate if we want to uh, join one edge grid, then uh, what's the traffic will be, such as we have some limitation uh, the traffic in one data center cannot be more than 75% of the capacity. So we need to do lots of simulations. And at that time, we also don't have a mature simulation tool. So there's lots of back and forth between the network engineer and the software engineer. And uh, during the migration, you know, each migration will take one or two months to finish because we need to 
do it step by step. And after every step, the actual traffic in every data center will change. So we need to redo the simulation after that. That's the reason why it will take a long time. We have time for one more question. Um, okay, then maybe I'll ask. I was intrigued by your comment that uh, you tried machine learning uh, methods and this didn't work, uh, which sort of you know goes against you know the common trend that now we're using machine learning everywhere <laughs> for networking. Can you maybe elaborate a bit more on what are the challenges and limitations, and perhaps if you see like you know a, a way ahead uh, in the future to uh, use machine learning or uh, integrate your system with some machine learning uh, uh, yes, capabilities. Uh, Yes, as we listed here, we tried some uh, new technologies, uh, the deep learning methods, to try to do this migration problem. But we met some practical obstacles, like the scalability. Uh, for example, we can do well on the small scale problems, but we can't. Uh, it's a little difficult to scale out to the large scale problem and complex migration types. And also, we also met some efficiency problem and reliability problems. Uh, and we list some reasons in our paper. And if you're interested, you can refer to our paper for more details. Thanks. Fantastic. OK. Any more questions? No? OK, then let's have the speakers again. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Professor Bin Liu, professor in the Computer Science Department of Chunga University. He is a research interest in high performance switching and routers, software defined programming networks, and is very happy with the university, so he's not on the job market. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. <coughs> uh, today I'll share uh, Clean Ink. Uh, basically, it's kind of work to achieve in network computing bus efficient. Uh, this work is co-achieved by my students, by my students, and um, how you soon from uh, future Lee and Wenfei Wu from Peking University as well as Gu uh, Yueliu from NYU China. Um, today, uh, I will um, thank you. Uh, let me share the high-level information uh, for details. Uh, please go to the paper. Uh, mainly on the first, how do we cook out this topic? And what is the idea and solution? And how about the evaluation uh, with the fast summary? Um, on sending in network computing, uh, I see uh, basically it's my personal sentence is to use the natural resource to offload the uh, application um, uh, comp computational tasks. Um, hopefully uh, to achieve um, good latency and uh, reduce cost uh, and power consumption. Um, but uh, the INC user uh, hope to and um, uh, use a, a simple way and they want to uh, use it to program their application uh, and uh, obtain a quick uh, production uh, as well as the good performance. And NC is obtaining increasingly application such as carry store, uh, DDoS, uh, defense, uh, machine learning related, and more. Uh, despite of the application themselves, let's review the production process of Yink applications. Um, the NC users or the developers usually require to do two kind of work. One is network domain, another is application domain. Um, <coughs> the de developer need to well-known then uh, 
uh, details of the natural resource and uh, suffering the pain to translate the application requirement to the device specific language. So this is um, not efficient and need longer time. So mm, our idea just to um, uh, explore the possibility to uh, reduce this kind of workload. Um, one reason is the network are growing with complexity. Uh, a lot of um, features, devices deployed and the running multi-pass forwarding as well as supporting multi-tenant applications. So facing this challenge, uh, some recent work tried to um, help reduce the workload of uh, IC de developer uh, either to mask the heterogeneity of the device or to help uh, dis distribute the complicated tasks into the course device in the network. This helps, however, uh, it's not enough to achieve a high efficiency. So what is the way to go for um, high efficient ink um, production? Um, referring to the cloud service provisioning uh, in data center, there we um, just utilize the natural resource um, as a logical view to the um, users. Similarly, in the network for INC, we do have uh, the heterogeneous device um, and we need to um, manage the course device orchestration. So um, how to address the network issue? Um, uh, becomes the challenge. We want to make the ink development as an app, not a development process. Given such, we want to mask the network details and we want to, the INC, we want to let the network to be transparent to the developers. Uh, I again, I want to isolate the multiple INC applications. So we have a, a beautiful dream, try to um, achieve the INC goal with a simple, clean uh, uh, INC. Uh, idea is to treat the INC as a service. We um, have three abstractions from the device level to the network level to the application level. With the goal of INC tools help to mask network details, provide an open API to customers and support uh, easy programming. In this way, the user only need to focus on their development and um, ignore uh, the complicated network issues. Uh, given such, we uh, provide uh, a simple API uh, using the Passing like language, um, 
providing three kind of model like um, template modular program and uh, user uh, themselves defined features. Does it show like this? Uh, from the architectural point, uh, we design and top to bottom high high actual um, layer to mapping the application requirement to the lower uh, programmable devices uh, via the com compiler task uh, allocator as well as the program and resource manager. Um, to uh, show the effect of uh, clean, we do some uh, experiments. Uh, we have designed uh, emulator, that is software tool, and um, build a real test bed, use physical devices to do the experiment. Uh, Result uh, show the clinic did does achieve good performance on different uh, network configurations. We choose an application example of sparse gradient parameter aggregation as an example. Here we can show uh, either on the pure smart smart NIC or uh, pure uh, network switches all combined. So they all achieve good uh, support and delay performance. Uh, besides, Clink's <coughs> uh, modular program abstraction provide high efficient ink de deployment. Uh, we uh, run three applications. Uh, Kvistal machine learning aggregation and um, database ac uh, ac acceleration. We can see comparing to the other work, um, Clink will use less line of code, um, but support more functions. Again, giving the higher abstraction Clean Ink uh, will support um, good quality of the programming and uh, need less debug. debug. Uh, again, Clean Ink uh, provide better scalability as the network size grows. Uh, <coughs> here, uh, we um, have a good algorithm called DP to um, do the task orchestration and allocation. Um, comparing to the traditional method of SMT, the DP can achieve 1,000 times faster. And uh, have less uh, uh, placement time with the similar um, quality. So quick summary. Uh, we, pr we propose a concept of INC as a service, and we design a top-bottom framework uh, to uh, quickly develop and developing the INC applications. And uh, we run, we, we design a software emulation, emul emulator, and, and do the real um, experiment by building a physical test bed to show the um, effectiveness of clinic. Um, cl clinic, a uh, lot of work to do. It is still on its early stage. Uh, our ongoing work, including um, application isolation and improve the uh, interface as well as uh, the 
parameter selection, and we plan to uh, extend the uh, device and to GPU and smart, more GPU and smart devices. Oh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thanks for the talk. Um, we have time for one question. My name is Tongyan Lee Kaist. Oh, how do you define modularity? Did you ask how you define modularity? Yes, how, how do you define modularity, modular programming? I'm Wang Fei Wu from Peking University, one of the authors. Uh, I, would, uh, I would answer the question. So for the modularity, first we summarize existing INC applications functions and uh, prepare it as the module, modules for the developers. Then we also uh, provide the interface and uh, inter intermediate representat uh, representation language for the developers so they can customize their own modules. Then all these modules are organized as Python modules. They can be composed using Python syntax to develop the INC program. Hi, thanks. Uh, this is Peter from the TikTok. So I saw your architecture, you mentioned the Trident for switch using the Broadcom the simulator. Could you give a little bit more, I know the time is short. Could you give a little bit the details and the, what's the purpose? Did you also change any pipeline oh. based on the BCM simulator? And also what's the performance if you use the simulator instead of hardware? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so this click link, it targets the heterogeneous network environment. So we use Python as the common programming language. We would uh, compile it to different uh, devices, including Trident. Mm, and uh, we also support P4 and uh, FPGA. For performance, we use an uh, emulator. We build the container networks with the Trident simulator as, one, as the network device node. So this, uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can evaluate its functionality, but uh, emulator cannot uh, represent its performance. So this is the result shows uh, showing uh, shows the compilation process is efficiency. Um, I think there was one last question. Um. Hi, I, I think it's a great talk. Um, I'm Xingjun from Huawei Technologies. I think it, uh, the colleague uh, colleagues try to provide a, inf a framework for uh, you know, uh, programming the whole network as a computation platform, which is a great idea. So I just have a question uh, for the slide 17. You try to compare the, uh, the sum, uh, something uh, for the performance. What's the baseline you try to compare with? Uh, what's, uh, what? what's, what's the baseline you oh. compare against the, for the performance? Uh, so on, the, on the slide 17. Yeah, yeah. so we, uh, well, we have a collecting program. We place it uh, distributedly. On the, in the, on the network devices. So the baseline is uh, SMT solver, uh, and uh, our algorithm is uh, uh, a dynamic programming-based algorithm. So uh, ours is polynomial time. The MSMT is, is not, it's, it's dynamic. But the result is, uh, is, uh, is the performance in terms of uh, the network performance, or just uh, uh, how you quick and quickly deploy the, uh, the yeah, software? Uh, it's uh, how the network devices are, uh, whether it's used efficiently, uh, okay. how many devices are, gotcha. are used. Thank you. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> so last but not least, here we have uh, Chuan, that is a final year PhD student in computer science from the National University of Singapore. His research uh, is uh, on programmable networks and their application. And finally, he's on the job market. So we have a speaker that is on the job market. So please reach out to him after the end of the session if you have interesting opportunities. OK, thank you. Thanks for the int introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Shawan. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm happy to share our work, Neural Load Balancing with Neural Reordering Support for RDMA. This is a joint work with my collaborators, Sinji, Raj, Inho, Jialin, and my advisor, Manchun. RDMA is the emerging standard in modern data centers. It provides high networking performance and low CPU overhead,
by offloading transport to hardware and bypassing host OS. It has shown its versatility with combination of many applications such as RPC, storage, and AIML, and practically with a deploy, deploy, production level deployment in data centers such as Microsoft and Alibaba Cloud, and probably more. Despite such benefits, we find that RDME doesn't fully use the high path diversity in data center networks. The reason is that existing load balancing schemes do not fit well with RDME. So in this talk, I will, I, will, I will explain why and what is our solution. First of all, let's revisit the existing solutions based on the re its rerouting granularity, such as per flow, per packet, and per flow lead. ECMP is de facto standard for RDME in data center, data center networks. It uses hash-based packet forwarding, so it guarantees in-order in packet delivery. Unfortunately, it, it cannot evenly distribute the flows based on their size because of hash collisions. So multiple elephant flows can be, colli can be collided in the, to the, into the same path. In the opposite way, for packet load balancing, such as packet spraying, makes rerouting decision for every packet, so it provides a near optimal load balance. However, it costs many out of other packets because different paths may have different delays. Uh, in addition, the RDME has, is, is known as highly sensitive to out of order packets. Indeed, from our experiment, we find that unlike TCP, RDME has no tolerance to out of order packet, and even a single out of order packet largely increases the flow completion time up to three times. To mitigate the out of order arrivals, existing solutions largely leverage flowlet design. It makes rerouting only if there is enough time gap between two packets, so it can effectively reduce the possibility of out-of-order arrivals. However, in, in RDME trees, it's not, uh, it's hardly, uh, the, such a, such a uh, large time gap is hardly found. We experimented check this through a bulk data transfer with eight concurrent connections. We measured the data fraction of the flowless size for TCP and RDME, and we tested on flow lead time gap threshold 10 and 100 microseconds. From the result, we find that we can easily find flow leads in TCP as a black line, but not in RDME in the red lines. The reason is, the reason is that in TCP, it used uh, batch processing for IO optimization, whereas RDME used hardware-based packet pacing. To recap, ideally, we want to achieve both fine grain load balancing and in-order packet delivery. However, existing solutions largely fail to uh, get both in the same time, at the same time. So our question is how to get this. To ensure in-order packet delivery, a natural idea is to restore packets back in order before they reach the destination. Then where, where we can do that? Uh, one may consider endos, but endos is not a viable option because RDME bypassed host OS and host cannot intervene in RDME communication. In addition, uh, commodity RDM hardware are predominantly, predominantly hard to modify their behavior. Instead, we find opportunity from the features of recent programmable switch, Intel Tofino 2. That supports um, in network, um, packet storing in the network with multiple FIFO queues and queue post resume capability. Unfortunately, it's, it's hard to re restore arbitrary packet orders on the switch. The reason is that uh, it is, it is, uh, there is a lack of, sorting lack of sorting primitives on switching hardware. Although we want to implement the sorting primitives on hardware, uh, it is challenging because of a limited sorting, uh, re limited resource and time for restoring and flushing packets at line rate. Here is an illustration. Let's say there are four packets coming in the reverse order. To reorder them, we need to store packets to multiple FIFO queues and flush them individually uh, uh, in the relays. So uh, it, it, is not, uh, it is not easy and uh, expensive to do it in line rate. So to make reordering manageable, how can we constrain the packet reordering patterns? So in this talk, we propose our solution, Conviv. Here is an overview. Conviv is running on Tor switches, so it is endos agnostic. At the source Tor, we make rerouting, and the packets are restored back in order at the destination Tor. From the previous lessons, we know that there is, uh, it's hard to find the time gaps and arbitrary packet order is not easily manageable. So we cautiously split the flow and make rerouting for the ease of reordering. Conviv used multiple techniques in lightweight path monitoring, congestion evasive path selecting, and cautious rerouting to incorporate the switch's reordering capability and packet reordering implementation on hardware. 
In this talk, I'll be describing the techniques in cautious rerouting, and more details can be found in the paper. Our key idea is to make rerouting only if there is no in-flight out-of-order package. It enables switches to reorder a flow using only a single reorder queue. Here is an example. Let's say there are two available paths between a pair of TOR switches, and the current path is congested, so we want to make rerouting. For the incoming packet, we put a packet tag tail that indicates this is the last packet before rerouting, and send it to the old path. After rerouting, for the next incoming packet, we send it to the new path. If it, it arrives too early, then it makes out-of-order packet. So we dynamically assign a reorder queue for the packet and, reorder, uh, and, and uh, buffer the packet. After some time, uh, when re destination receives the tail packet, th that indicates that all packets before rerouting have processed, so uh, we flush the reorder queue. After flushing the queue, we release the queue for resource efficiency and redirect the flow to the normal queue. After that, we, we send a clear packet to the source store, saying that there is no more in-flight packet, so we can start a new rerouting. Over the loop, commit consistently reroutes a uh, flow for a fine grade load balancing when congestion is detected while delivering packets in order. We performed the experiment on Rocky V2 testbed with, uh, on lossless Ethernet. We used 2 to 4 list fine topology with 16 RGB nodes on 25G ports. We compared Conway with existing solutions, ECMP, LeftFlow, and Drill, under a narrow load 80% with RPC workload. We measured the average and 99.9 percentile tail uh, flow completion time. From the result, what we find is that existing solutions, flow lead, and perfect rerouting does not perform better than ECMP, which is what we expected in the previous discussion. In addition, we find that RDME effectively reduced the flow completion time compared to ECMP, such as 16% and 44%, respectively, for the average and 99.9% uh, percentile FCT. The main overhead of the conweave is the buffer and queue usage for packet reordering. To evaluate the re uh, overhead, we, met, we performed the experiment on 128 hosts on 100G links with narrow load 80% with diverse workloads such as RPC, storage, and Hadoop. Over the entire evaluation, we find that the maximum size of the buffer usage per switch is less than 2.5 megabytes, and the maximum number of the queue usage per port is less than 10. To put this result into the context, uh, the overhead is much less than the switches, recent programmable switches capacity, uh, such as tens of megabytes of the packet buffer and up to 100 of the physical queues. To recap, we propose Conweave, a network load balancer specifically designed for RDMA. Throughout the techniques, we achieve fine grained load balancing and in order packet delivery. Conweave is endos agnostic, so it's compatible with commodity RDMA hardwares and Rocky V2 compatible. Thank you for listening. Thanks for the amazing talk. Uh, questions? Yes. Hi. Thanks. Great talk. This is Mahmoud from Huawei. So I, uh, allow me to be a, be a bad guy here. When you said that you would need one queue, if you have multiple queues, uh, multiple flows, and you have the tail for, let's say, flow one and two, and you are waiting for the, t the tail for flow three, and you have to flush the queue, you are in a very bad situation because flow three is already in the queue. Uh, basically, we are using per flow queue scheme. So when the flow comes in, we buffer the, uh, we assign the queue to the uh, specific flow, and then we f after flush the queue, then queue is, will be assigned to the next active flow. Yes. So you need two queues per flow. Sorry, two queue for two queues per flow. With flow. Two queues per each flow. Per uh, each flow. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sana from John Hopkins. Um, so data center networks are quite bursty and um, a lot of in-cast events occur. How do you think this um, design would work under such workload, especially under heavy in-casts? Okay, that's a very good question. So in our economy work, we are focusing on the TORS uplink to destination TORS uplink. So we are not focusing on the in-cast. In-cast is happening in the, at the downlink of the TORS switches. So in this case, we are leveraging the congestion control instead of uh, handling the network side. 
Incas is uh, typically a multi, multiple senders uh, are sending the fact, sending flows to the one destination. So Incas happens at the destination, destination towards uh, that link. So in Conview, we are not covering that issue. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and can I call all the speakers back on stage? We do like a mini panel. Okay, questions? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, this is Xing Jun from Huawei Technology. I just uh, have a question on top of what just Mohammed asked about low balancing. Because if you have one flow, uh, two Q per flow, have you tried AI, tra uh, AI training? Because for the AI training, they have a lot of concurrent flows. For example, for the map reduce, right? So the switch has a limited number of uh, queues. So easily it's gonna run. Even you use the dynamic, you know, try to reuse queue as much as you can, but it, because they have a lot of concurrent flows, it's easily run off the, run off the queue, right? So how are they gonna solve that problem? Uh, have you ever tried AI traffic? Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry to make you, make, uh, make you confused. Um, um, each flow, uh, sorry, I, I, I made a wrong answer to you. Actually, uh, one flow use one queue for reordering, but uh, there is a common queue for uh, every flow uh, no, as a normal queue. So uh, yeah, one flow, one queue, that's correct. But uh, one, the other, I mean, one flow use two queues. One is uh, shared by other, all other flows, of, of, of course, like uh, as a normal queue, and one, one queue is for reordering. And, um, about the uh, 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 concurrent connections, uh, we believe the reordering uh, happens not for every flows. It's only for the active flows, and among the active flows, also the part of the flows uh, need packet reordering. And uh, in addition, uh, reordering can be controlled by the source tour, like uh, who makes make makes the reorder make a reroute, rerouting. Thank you. I think the Eddie has a question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, okay. Does that mean, this is, this is a follow-up, does that mean that you could reorder at most uh, like 127 flows at a time? I, realized, I, I would like to say no, <laughs> because the, some of the queues are used for other purpose. Uh, but from our experiment, we see that uh, the overhead, like a num especially the number of queues are not very significant. Uh, especially less than 10, and most serious, uh, serious case, like 90% all the network is uh, uh, full, only the Q usage is less than 15 at the maximum. Okay, and maybe if I, can we take that offline? Okay. Because sorry, I want to give everyone a chance to, to speak. Are there questions? Um, yeah. As long as it's not about, you know, number of queues and... <laughs> No, no, no. Um, yes, I, I'm Roman from Huawei Technologies. I have a question for uh, ClickNick uh, work. Uh, you said that you uh, match uh, computation task to devices, right? To heterogeneous devices. And do you consider uh, traffic pattern while matching or not? In the current work, we didn't consider that. So if we need to consider traffic pattern, mm, I think these functions are independent from traffic pattern because uh, different uh, functions, they process different, uh, uh, they have different uh, functionalities. Different module has different functionalities. So the different uh, applications, they are isolated and processed by the different uh, modules. Um, so I think it's an independent problem. It's mm. uh, actually, uh, cleaning will do the pre-planning of the application. So uh, given such, so it, it is dependent to the traffic 
and also to the traffic pattern. Okay, one last question. Okay, maybe I'll take the opportunity as a chair to ask a question. So we heard uh, a lot of great work about in network compute. So I was wondering, you know, for example, for the first two papers, how would the have it be in network compute it becomes mainstream? How would this actually impact, uh, for example, like network migration? Or for example, like, you know, the uh, programmability and flexibility you were discussing? I mean, what kind of challenges, but also opportunities uh, you see? For example, if you, let's start with uh, uh, you guys. For example, if you have to migrate, as part of the migration, you also need to migrate state in the switch. I, uh, hello, I think the most obvious difficulty is that the number of switch and the number of circuit is very huge. So there are a large number of possible solutions. And besides that, since Meta has built a data center for several decades, so there are different versions of uh, network structures coexist in one data center. So that's the reason why the migration is very difficult. We need to uh, analyze them case by case. So for this reason, usually it involves lots of manual works. We need to do lots of manual calculations on specific data centers. So uh, in the future, I think the Kowalski or in the future we can use deep learning reinforced learning method to accelerate this process to make it more efficient. Maybe to you, a question. If you have, for example, in network compute capabilities. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, for the uh, virtual switch uh, logic uh, offload to the, such as the top of the rack, I think the, uh, the reason we don't, we don't suggest that is because we, we like to leverage the strength on both physical network and the virtual network. For per our understanding, the physical V switch is better suited to the high performance. We want to keep it simple because we it, because it always have limited CPU resources and memory resources. And, but it is an interesting topic due to the heavy due to the in uneven distribution of the of the cloud networks so such as an and the and more and more powerful uh, dpu to emerge such as the md pancedo it has uh, enormous flow cache so we we also it it is an interesting topic to explore it to Explore it further. Okay. All right. That sounds like a great topic to continue over the coffee break. So let's thank again all the speakers.